Hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is about visiting North Keppel Island, a little bit more chart work, and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. This video starts during our last couple of days at Great Keppel Island, so let's go back to that. I notice it's quite popular these days to add wheels to the transom of the inflatable tenders. Tide's on the way up, so we need to pull Red Dwarf further up the beach, so I don't have to swim tonight, I'm going for dinner on the island. Definitely think it's worth looking into adding a set, doesn't look that hard. After a very nice evening and a beautiful sunset, there was a bit of drama the following day when a rescue helicopter came to the island. The helicopter spent a bit of time looking around the headland but eventually they lowered someone down so they obviously found the person they were looking for. Once the crew members were dropped down, the helicopter went and landed at the airstrip that's behind the old resort, obviously sort of saving fuel while they got that person ready to be lifted out. Trouble was, when they went to take off again, I saw all the birds went crazy and started flocking around the area it was, which made taking off again dangerous. Yeah, it sounds like he's moving off but low down. I reckon he's trying to get away from them before pulling up. Because the runway goes right behind there, doesn't it? I reckon he's gone along the runway to get away from them. Yeah, yeah. Done more like a plane takeoff to avoid the birds. Interesting. It wasn't long after that before everyone was picked up again and they headed back to the mainland, so I hope everyone's okay. That afternoon I decided to head over to the beach and do a bit more metal detecting before we left. Edge of a coin here, most likely nothing. Been finding a few old one and two cent pieces though, so obviously things are uh, catching up in these rocks on the edge of the beach. Acts like a sort of gold pan almost, if you know what I mean. Things get caught here when the waves bring them in and they don't uh, wash away again. Maybe a 10 cent piece actually, it's definitely bigger than a five. But not old, not silver or anything. I don't know, 20. How about that? We're rich find another 30 of those and we can buy a Coopers. About to leave Great Keppel Island now and we're just heading over to the mainland over there to get water, food and hopefully pick up the surface supply dive compressor. It's only about 10 nautical miles over there so it'll only take us an hour and a bit and then uh, we'll stay tonight, have a day to do some shopping tomorrow, stay the next night and then head back probably to North Keppel Island which is over here. Stay in the area, but uh, a little bit of change of scene. Anyway, put a waypoint on the Ray Marine unit and uh, we'll just head straight to it. I had read recently that there's a bit of a southerly current that comes through this area. So as we headed west, it made sense that the autopilot was using a little bit of starboard rudder to keep us on course in that current. Here on AIS, you can see a vessel called Reflection that was coming out from the harbour we were heading to. It's flashing red because it detects there's a potential collision, so we just turned a little bit to starboard. I'll definitely do a separate video soon talking all about AAS, what it does, how it works. 
Once we were in the marina, I got to watch these seagulls trying to steal every fish that the shags caught. It was pretty funny. We filled up and we're about to head to North Keppel Island now. The uh, fuel here, nice headland at uh, Great Keppel Bay Marina. It's actually not a part of the marina, it's a part of the fish gulp I think. But quite good, petrol and diesel, and the diesel's got a high flow switch so you can uh, set it for a lower flow on smaller boats like Renko. All right, let's go. On the way out to North Keppel, we passed back through the curry stain, but without any issues. It was a little bit choppy on the way out, but it didn't take that long to get there about an hour and a half or so, which is good. Nice short trip. Right next to North Keppel, there's a smaller island called Pumpkin Island, and there's a little resort on there, which is kind of cool to see. Me being me, the first thing I decided to do was go metal detecting again in some of the caves on the island. Just found a fork in here. It's got some symbols on the back clean it up and have a look what they say when we get back to the boat. Probably nothing that old, but it's in relatively good condition. The wind picked up while we were at North Keppel. It was coming from the north, so we were in the lee of the island, which helped a lot. Sounds like someone calling in for a weather update because of the winds we're getting. Might hang around and listen to that. Confirms uh, 27.5 knots gusting 35. Uh, we're about to check uh, bomb radar. Over. Thank you, your phone. Uh, yeah, I've, I've paid out uh, all cable I've got. Uh, she seems to be holding, but I'm ready to clutch ahead. Over. Might have a look at the radar myself. Esperer Coast Guard Japan on 16 over. Esperer, go ahead, Japan. The uh, radar shows some storm cells to the south, slipping away to the southeast. Uh, nothing approaching us at this time, over. Roger that. Thank you, Japan. Um, I'll just uh, sit, sit where I am then. Uh, thanks for that, guys. Definitely got to say I've got a lot more faith in the uh, Dyneema than I did originally. I mean the reality is it's got twice the braking strain of that 16 mil nylon rope I towed Pete's Halverson with so it's pretty good. No issues with the winch both taking the load through the gearbox and being bolted to the wheelhouse. This never flexes anything like that, bolts aren't shifting, it's all been pretty good. Yeah very happy with that setup sitting back quite a way on the line, which is good, gives us good holding. Every now and then I let out six inches of line just to avoid the same piece potentially chafing, but that's all I do. The good news is the wind has died down. The barometer started dropping a few points, but not particularly quickly did get me starting to work on a video about weather, but that'll take a while to finish. Winds turned to the south during the night, so we were no longer in the lee of the island. Going to head over to the mainland to one of the harbours here. See what it looks like. New alternator looks to be working well. Occasionally getting, uh, you know, 22 amps maybe. The limit on the, there we go, 22. The limit on the Victron is 17 amps, so that's going to be 17 amps of alternator plus 5 amps, oh well, there we go, 7 amps of um, solar as well. You can put more of those Victron units in parallel to jump it up to 34 amps or whatever, but I think this is pretty good for me for now.
the approach to this harbour was a little bit tricky. A few shallow spots, lots of breaking waves off to the port side. But by following the deep sections on the Raymarine sat-nav, we ended up getting them pretty easily. You can see the bottom started to get quite shallow. And then as we get into this section, you can start to see that it goes from a silty bottom to starting to have more rock visible. As we got towards the part of the bay we wanted to anchor, the bottom became sandy again, which was great for good holding on the anchor. And we went through our standard routine, which is me driving the boat and Vicky operating the Axiom to set the anchor alarm. It's kind of good to have two people doing it because you want to mark your anchor position, as she did us then, as the anchor hits the bottom then I can go in reverse and we can see how much chain we're letting out and adjust the chain out, essentially, the chain length, so that we stay within that circle. If the unit detects you go outside that circle via the GPS, it'll sound an alarm, as you see a little bit later on. Once you've finished running out the amount of scope you want on the anchor road, you tell it that's the amount of chain out, set the alarm to be on, and it'll start monitoring and it'll also start a track so you can see where you're moving. Good morning. It's nice and calm this morning. It's been really windy, so I figure it's time to show you the charts while they won't blow away, but I also haven't had a coffee or anything, so bear with me. All right, this is the chart we were on last time. We came originally Lady Musgrave up to Gladstone, up through the Narrows, and then up to Great Keppel Island. We've now headed a little bit further north, so we are going to move to the next chart. We went from Great Keppel here, now at the south end of this chart, 820, and headed over to Roslyn Bay, which is Keppel Bay Marina, and then after that we headed up to North Keppel. Something jumping just there. Seems like a popular spot for fishing actually. Could be the first place I'm tempted to dangle a line since we left, after the mutton bird incident. All right, as the weather got bad at North Keppel Island, we eventually came up here into Corio Bay, nice and sheltered once we were around the corner. It was a little bit rough coming in, but we didn't pick a particularly good tide, so that's mostly my fault. All right, what we'll do though, is last time we showed a line that was a true bearing. That's okay in the land of sort of GPS, because most of the time we do deal with true, but a few commenters mentioned about converting to magnetic, so I'll show you that now. So, we were about here in North Keppel, we came out this way and then headed up to here. As you saw last week, we can simply take this line, if I can see past the shadow, and then move it to the nearest of the compass roses. Even the nearest is a bit further away, so that's okay. Come back and then come to the center. You can see here, our bearing is about 330 degrees true. This is a bit of a table you can use for figuring out how to convert true to compass. So these stand for, actually I'll write them in for you. Starting with true, going to compass, and in between we need to use our variation off the chart to go to magnetic, and then the deviation from the boat itself to go to compass. True north is pointing at the point that is the rotational axis of the Earth, whereas magnetic north is pointing to the magnetic north pole, and they're not the same thing. This discrepancy between the magnetic north pole and the true north pole, the axis we're rotating on, changes depending on where you are in the world. You can even see here, just across Australia, it goes from 16 degrees east down uh, uh, Tasmania way, up to two degrees west as you get to over towards Perth. So you need to know what the variation is for where you are. This quite conveniently is printed on the compass rows of every chart. So you know what the figure is and you know it's local for the area you're working in. In this case, they're saying uh, nine degrees, 15 minutes east. 
in practice at sea, it's very difficult to steer a boat to point something of a degree, even to one degree, depending on sea state. But I will show you some of the finer points now, just for the sake of completeness, given we're going through this. Here on one of the other compass roses on the same chart, this three on this chart, three on most charts, you'll see that it's actually nine degrees, 20 minutes. So it goes to show how the magnetic variation changes even across a single chart, but it also changes with time. The North and South Poles are moving on the Earth. They're not static like the rotational axis, true north. It says here that the variation changes one minute west every year. So one sixtieth of a degree every year. So this is a bit like that amulet in Indiana Jones that the guy burnt his hand on. It's essentially saying we have a variation of nine degrees, 20 minutes or 15 minutes, depending where you are. But we have to take back one minute of variation for every year since the chart was printed. You can see here that the variation on the chart was correct for 2014. So we now have to make this adjustment for seven years worth of change. Now we're here, it's actually nine degrees, eight minutes east. If this error had been east, it would be nine degrees and 22 minutes east. So because it's west, we're taking it back. Don't get me wrong, I'm only gonna use the nine degrees, but it's worth being aware of because you may have a chart that's 20 years old and it's telling you that it moves by eight minutes every year, and it can add up to be something significant. All right, this means that our true bearing was 333 measured off the chart, and nine degrees east. That's more than enough. The rule you need to remember is that when the error is east, the compass reads least. When the error is west, the compass reads best. So, with an east error, we subtract nine. With a west error, we add nine. In this case, we now know that our magnetic is 324. To make things a little bit more complicated, the boat itself also has its own magnetic field, which is called the deviation. This magnetic uh, bearing is a theoretical ideal magnetic bearing without the boat taken into account, and that's what we're taking into account next. Now, the deviation of a boat changes depending on which way the boat is facing. This deviation gets reduced as much as possible when they swing the compass. By swinging a compass, you make it as accurate as possible, but where you can't tune the error out, they also produce what's called a deviation card or a deviation chart. So I'll show you one of those. This is pretty much the book you study for a coxswain's course or something like that in Australia. And hopefully somewhere from memory, here we go. Here are some sample deviation cards. So this is the sort of thing that the person who swings your compass would produce for you now the reason you have a single variation value for the chart and multiples for the boat is that once you're in a certain point in the earth that is your variation but when you're on the boat this could be my boat my little metal detecting find a bit old school uh, is that you have here so for example when you're facing north your deviations 10 degrees east by the time you're turned 20 degrees to the east your error is now eight degrees east. So the error or the deviation changes depending on which way you're facing, whereas the variation changes based on where you are in the world. Now you can read this two ways, compass going to magnetic or magnetic going to compass. In our case, we need to convert magnetic to compass, but if, for example, you had taken a bearing or something and you were trying to figure out, you know, the true path to it to plot that on the chart, then you'd be going the other way. So, what we know so far is we're trying to steer 324 magnetic. Then, if we come to our chart, here we go, 326, pretty close. So, we want 326 magnetic, which means the error is 6 east. The 9 east here was the error for the region of the world we were in. Then, the 6 east error here is the error for our boat when it's facing in this particular direction. Then, if we apply 6 degrees east deviation to the magnetic, we end up with 318 compass. So, if we're trying to go 333 on our chart, we need to steer 318 on the compass. If we just steer 333 on our compass, we're going to end up way off course. There are plenty of little ways of remembering this. I think I was taught true virgins make dull companions. There's lots of other ones, but they get even dodgier. We'll leave it there for today. I don't want to fry people's brains, but um, rather than doing 
another big chart work video, I think it's good just to throw little bits and pieces that are relevant each uh, you know, week as we go. Another really good tip from a viewer, which I didn't know, can teach an old dog new tricks. With these dividers, rather than being like normal compasses where you sort of open it up and get your distance, so we got five nautical miles off the chart last time this way, he was saying that you actually use them one-handed because you can squeeze this loop, you can close them up a bit, and you can open them up. So they're designed to be used one-handed, which is kind of clever. So there's our five nautical miles off the latitude. And then we can look here and say, yeah, it's roughly 10 nautical miles to get here. So it took us a little bit over an hour. So thank you. Good tip. The following day it got a little bit blowy again, a bit of rain, but it uh, did give me a chance to make sure that my uh, anchor alarm actually works, so that was the upside. is it? Wow. I think the anchor dragging alarm was just because we're spinning to a weird direction but I'll keep an eye on that. Glad we're in the harbour. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed and perhaps even learned a little bit from this video. At the end, you may have noticed those yellow hoses on deck. They are the air hoses for the new electric dive hooker, so I'll be showing you that next week. All right, take care, I'll catch you then. See ya.